Amen. And let's remember, uh, we want to apply the Word of God. It's the Word of God applied that will make a difference in our lives, right? So uh, when he gets towards the end of his message and he says, let's stand, we're going to stand and uh, close it out with him. Sound good? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Turn with me, please, if you would, to the... ...in the real, actual, miracle-working power of God... And now we're, we're looking at how Jesus had manifestations of this power. Because when Jesus would speak, things happened, didn't they? Power manifestations occurred, and they, they occurred when he spoke. It was his words. It was the main way that this power was released. In uh, Luke, the fourth chapter, verse 32, Luke 4.32, said they were astonished at his doctrine, his, his teaching and preaching, for his word was with power. Astonished is a strong word. They were, they were in awe of, of when he spoke. Why were they in awe? His word was with power. Everybody said out loud, his word, his word. Was, with was with power. Verse 33 said, in the synagogue there was a man that had an unclean spirit. And verse 35, Jesus rebuked him and said, hold your peace. In other words, be quiet. Come out of him. And he did. And verse 36, they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. He, he commanded that to happen, and it did. It did. Then it said, the fame of him went into every place in the country round about. He arose out of the synagogue, entered into Simon's house. Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever. They besought him for her. And verse 39, he stood over her and did what? Rebuked the fever. Now this is not even in the vicinity of most church going people's thinking. What, what do you mean? Well, in most churches, if some said, man, I've been running a fever and I don't know what to do about it, uh, would most of the church respond and go, well, have you, have you rebuked it? So I said, well, yeah, but Brother Keith, that's Jesus. Exactly. Jesus showing us how to do it. Now, if you haven't been with us and you think, well, I, I, I think Jesus could do that, but, but not other people, well, you, you think wrong. And we've already covered a lot of scripture about that. And you say, well, I, if you say, well, I, I got a right to my beliefs. No, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to believe the Bible. Yes. Not just make up your own beliefs. And you're supposed to allow the word of God to change what you believe. Even if you and your parents and grandparents have believed it, for generations, the word is right. Yes. And even if something is an old belief, even if it goes back 500 years, that doesn't make it right. Old doesn't equal right. If it was wrong 500 years ago, yep. it's still wrong today. <laughs> no matter how many people believe it. And uh, Jesus said, if you believe on me, the works I do, You'll do also. Did he say it or not? How many believe on him? And he specifically said in Matthew 21, when he spoke to that fig tree, same thing that's recorded in Mark 11, he said, if you have faith and won't doubt, you can not only do what is done to the fig tree, but if you say to this mountain, be removed. Don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say comes to pass. You'll have what you say. Is he telling them they could do what he did? Yes. Just as plain as you can say it. So 
Jesus had manifestations of power when he spoke. How are we going to have manifestations of power? Same way. When we speak. But it's not just speaking. It's believing and speaking. It's entirely possible to say all kind of things and there be no power in it at all. The Bible talks about vain speech, empty words, idle words, non-producing words. So certainly we know that, that not everything people say is going to come to pass. But Jesus didn't say everything people said would come to pass. He said if you'd believe in your heart, yep. right? Yep. Not doubt what you say, but believe that what you say. And I think we've gone over that part too quickly. You got to be fully persuaded. Yes. You can't be questioning and wondering and wavering. You got to get it settled. And when you are fully convinced, yep. when you are fully persuaded of what God said, that's when you can open up your mouth and speak with some power. Yes. Oh, somebody say, praise God. And if you say, well I, well, I hadn't been like that. Well, that's why you need to read your Bible. You need to read your chapter every day. That's why you need to come to church. That's why you need to get in good meetings. You need to feed on things until you get full of the word, full of truth, full of faith, and it will push out the wavering. It'll displace the questioning. Right? And if you're not there yet, well, don't despair. Just keep putting the truth in you. Keep listening to the right thing. Keep meditating on the right thing. And your words will become more potent, more powerful, the more persuaded you get. Now, go with me, if you would, please, to James, the first chapter. You know, we've talked quite a bit about this. But there is a great need for repetition. Repetition. Uh, my father in the faith, uh, Kenneth Hagin, Sr., who's in heaven now, he, he was known for preaching the same things. <laughs> and boy, the longer I go, the more I see why. Oh, man. I don't care how well something is taught or preached or how thoroughly something is covered. That does not mean people heard it. Or got it. I, I've been so surprised sometimes that people that I know that have heard me preach something numerous times and then I preached it for the 30th time and they said, man, I never heard that before. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't say that. I just go, praise God. Praise God. And one reason I don't say anything is because I'm sure I've done the same thing. Huh? Uh, <laughs> hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. Uh, because you can hear and not hear. And uh, it's amazing what folks don't hear. And <laughs> Brother Hagin used to say, once in a while he'd say, they just sat right there and didn't get a thing. <laughs> you, could, you could hear a little frustration there. And now, some 40 years into this, I'm, I, I go, yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay. Now I know why you just start and you say it like you've never said it before, even though you've said it 50 times, because there are people who are hearing it for the very first time. Even people who heard it before are actually only just now hearing it. Uh, but thank God, the truth, when you get it, yeah. it'll make you free. Yeah. It'll make you free. And the reason I say that is because most Christians don't believe that death and life is in the power of the tongue. If you would read that verse to them or have them read it and say, do you believe that? They'd say, yeah, yeah, okay, because it's in the Bible. But I know they don't believe it. I say, why, brother, how do you know? Because of the way they talk. If you really believed that what you were saying, 
is shaping your life, then you'd be a fool to knowingly say things that you know is restricting you and hurting you and keeping you back from being free. You'd be a fool if you knew it, if you believed it, and you did it anyway. So most of the church doesn't even talk about the power of your words and confession. They, they've coined little uh, disrespectful phrases for us like the blab it and grab it, yes. you know, confess it and possess it yes. bunch. Yes. But uh, Jesus is the one who said, right? right? right. 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 Jesus, so who are you disrespecting? Yeah, exactly. Who are you mocking? And, you know, there was a time when I didn't see it either. So we want to be compassionate and patient with people. But we can't control what everybody else believes. But can we accept what Jesus said about this and believe that our words matter? Somebody say, my words matter. It matters what comes out of my mouth. It matters. It matters. In fact, in James, uh, he talks about it in the first chapter. He talks a lot about it in the third chapter. But in, in chapter 1, 22, 1 and 22, talks about being a doer. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Well, let's be specific about this. Does the word tell us that uh, life, death and life is in the power of the tongue. Yes. Uh, does he uh, tell us that every non-productive word that we speak we'll have to give an account of? Does, are there numerous things like this? Do we want to be a doer of this word concerning our mouths and our tongues and our words? If you don't, then you're deceiving yourself. Verse 23 if any be a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He beholds himself, goes his way, straightway forgets what manner of man he was. Whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. What, what does that mean? You don't just come here this morning and make a couple of notes about confession and, and write down Words matter. <laughs> and then tomorrow, talk like an unbeliever. Hmm? If you do, then there will be no benefit. You won't be blessed in your deed. You'll be kidding yourself because you heard the message that you're doing it. But just because you heard it, that doesn't mean you're doing it. Verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Now that's a big phrase. That's a big statement. What would make your religion vain? Not controlling your tongue. Do we believe this or not? Huh? Is this, is this the Bible? Listen to the NIV. The NIV says, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. The number one way we act our faith is with what we say. There are other actions, but the number one way, the main way, for instance, how did you get born again? Huh? How does faith come? By hearing. But what's the number one way faith is released? saying. The faith comes by hearing. But you can have faith and have no results. Faith has to be released. 
Faith without an action, James says, is, is dead, non-productive. And how did you get born again? Huh? Well, put, uh, put it up on the screen, Romans 10. Romans 10 and, and 9. He said, if you're what? Huh? Mentally, silently, <laughs> with your mouth. Right? God's so smart. He knows how to say things. Right? So there's no ambiguity. Because, I mean, in one sense you would think, well, is it necessary to say confess with your mouth? Yeah, it is. <laughs> with your mouth. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Not one thing. Right? Not just one thing, two things. You believe it in your heart and you what? You say it with your mouth. Verse 10, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession. Everybody say confession. confession. This is why we believe in confession, because yes. it's the Bible. That's right. Confession is made unto salvation. You believed it. You didn't see anything yet. You didn't feel anything yet. But you believed it and then you said it. That's right. That's right. And when you said it is when you came into it. Yes. Confession. Somebody say confession. confession. Unto, Unto. Salvation. salvation. That's how you walked into it. The power was released when you acted on what you believed in your heart and in this situation, your whole act was what you said. Right? There was power released in Jesus' ministry, right and left. When was that power released? Exactly when. When he said, be loosed. Oh, hallelujah. Rise. Take up your bed and walk. Oh, somebody say, praise God. There's no coincidence that exactly when he said it was when the power manifested. It was through the spoken word. In fact, we're told everything that exists, the planet you're standing on, came into existence when God spoke. If a person does not control, you or me, doesn't control our tongue our religion, which is our, our outward, the, the meaning of this is the outward demonstration of your godliness, your piousness, is useless, vain, if you don't control your mouth. Do we believe that or not, church? Most people don't believe that, but do we believe it? We can't control everybody. Somebody say, I believe the Bible. I believe, I believe the Bible. Should we watch what comes out of our mouth so that our religion is not in vain? Go with me to the book of Isaiah and notice a powerful word, Isaiah 57. Well, let's do it this way. Go to Proverbs 18 and then we'll go, I think, to Isaiah. Proverbs 18 and 20. I'm, I'm believing for revelation. Yeah, I'm believing with you. Yes, sir. Right? That we won't have the hearing and not hearing today. Amen. But we'll have hearing and hearing. Yes. And seeing. Yes. And getting. Yes. Receiving. Yes. He said, a man's belly will be satisfied with what? The sweat of his brow. Huh? Huh? Good old hard work is what will get you through. Meet all your needs. Work is a part of what we're supposed to do. Everybody's supposed to be uh, not lazy and slothful, but to be diligent. But it's not true 
that work will meet all your needs. There are people working three jobs and, and, and not making it. Mm -mm. You are, and, and some people have tried to say that it's their, their belief, their tenant that, you know, hard work fixes everything. It does not. And that hard work will assure that you are successful. It will not. Working hard will not assure your success. Now, some folks don't like that. Hmm? Somebody said, well, well, I believe it. Where's it at? Where's that verse at in the Bible? Mm -mm. There's a God. You need his help. He has a plan for you. His plan works great. Your plan? Not so much. Huh? Uh-uh. <laughs> uh, notice in this passage in Proverbs 18, you, your belly will be satisfied with what? With what? The fruit of your mouth. Now you're going to see, we're going to see that phrase several other places. It shows up in the scriptures, the fruit of of your mouth or the fruit of your lips. The same word fruit can be produced, excuse me, can be translated produce or produce, both as a, as a verb or a noun. Uh, the produce of your mouth is what will cause you to be satisfied and your needs to be met. Do we believe that or not? Huh? Oh, church. This is exciting. This is breakthrough. Yes, you're supposed to work. Yes, you're supposed to do some things. Yes, you're supposed to give. Yes, you're, if you really want to do well, you need to learn how to make some investments and, and do some things. But that alone will not assure your success. And even if you did work hard, make a bunch of money, you can lose it overnight. It doesn't assure success. But this is how you get success in God. Hmm? You get a hold of your mouth. And you discipline what you say. About your business. And about your life. And you give God something he can work with. And you don't speak words contrary to what he has said. Or against him. What do you mean? If my belly is going to be satisfied by the fruit of my mouth and the increase of my lips, you can begin saying it right now today. I will live well all the days of my life. All my needs are continually supplied by his riches in glory. In Christ Jesus. Now that's a vast difference from saying, man, the country's in such a mess. They're laying off at the factory. I just don't know if we're going to make it. That's how an unbeliever talks. And yet, most Christians talk the same way. And have been conformed to this world and not transformed by the renewing of their mind. You'll eat good, you're, 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 you'll be satisfied by what? The fruit of your mouth. And then the complete Jewish says, with what his lips produce, he'll be filled. And that's when the next verse says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it, We'll eat the fruit there. He just got through saying, your mouth will produce it. The fruit of it. Well, what, which, which fruit will you eat? Well, whichever one you decide to say. That's right. You will experience death fruit or life fruit. Depending if you talk what you see and feel and hear in the unbelieving, fearful, ungodly world around you. Or 
if you refuse to say those things, no matter how it looks and feels, and you choose to say what he says about your situation. If he says you're saved, then you say you're saved, no matter how you feel. If he says you're righteous and holy, you say you're right, no matter how you look or how you feel or even how you've acted. You agree with it? Now you might say, well, I, I don't know about all that. Do you want to stay in depression? No. We're talking about how to get out. If you're not satisfied in an area, check up on what's been coming out of your mouth about that, that area. There, this is spiritual warfare and conflict. The enemy, his uh, cohort, cohorts, his servants are continually pushing against us to say the wrong thing. Why? They want you to say something in this realm and mean it that they can work with, that they can cause to come to pass in your life. They want you to speak words full of fear, words full of defeat, words full of anger and, so that they can act on it. Well, the Holy Spirit, if we'll listen to him, he's endeavoring to prompt us. Yeah. Say this. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Say this. Why? So he can act on it. Yeah. He can manifest it and bring it to pass in our lives. Now, I know a lot of people don't believe that. They think, well, no, God's doing whatever he wants to do. He has, in his own wisdom, determined not to override human will. So he's limited his self. We didn't limit him in that, that regard, but he's limited himself. He won't make you say the right thing no matter how much you need to. Our mouths are truly in our total control. But if we're wise, we will speak the word only. Somebody said out loud, speak the word only, which means whatever comes up, your first thing is don't say anything. <laughs> then number two, find out what he said about it. Yes. Come on, y'all with me or not? The first thing is shut up. Yes. Be quiet. Why? Because you'll be tempted to say the wrong thing. You'll be pushed to say some wrong words over yourself in situations, especially when it's something you really care about or something that's really a, a situation. First, first step, bite your lip. Yeah. Hmm? Second step, what, what did God say about this? Number one, what did he say about it in his word? And then also anything he's saying to me by his spirit about this that's going to be in line with his word. Then number three, Say what he said and, and just keep saying what he said, no matter what it looks like, what it feels like, say it out loud. Say, say what, he said. what he said, what he said. In Isaiah, now 57th chapter, Isaiah 57, and 18. He said, I have seen his ways and will heal him. He's talking about the wayward person. I will lead him also and restore comforts to him and his mourners. Now, let's just stop right there before we go to the next verse. This is healing. This is restoration. This is comfort. Does this sound good to anybody? Yeah. Healing, restoration, comfort. How's it going to happen? Look at the next verse. I create the what? The fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. By what? By the fruit of his lips or her lips. By the fruit of of your mouth. This word create, exactly the same word in Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
How did he create the heavens and the earth? Come on, church. How? He spoke them into existence. He conceived the vision of it. He had the understanding of it, what it took, what its makeup was, how it functioned and worked. He saw it. He knew it. And he released his faith and spoke it into existence. I know a lot of people don't believe that, but uh, how did it get here? You weren't there. How do you know? A lot of people are trying to believe it, it's self-created. It sprang into existence by itself. We don't know of anything that has ever done that. So that's not science. That's a misguided belief. And we've chosen to believe Genesis. Hmm? I hadn't seen anything that disproves it. And the more I learn, the more I see that confirms it. <laughs> this book is not just the words of men. It is far, far too advanced. It is astounding. The more you learn about the Word of God, you, you, you just sit back and go, that's got to be God. I mean, nobody could think that up. Nobody could come up with that. Nobody could know that. 10,000 years ahead of time. Right. Nobody could understand that when nobody had found that out yet. And it's the Word of God. And if He said that's how it happened, that's how it happened. Well, what about in your life? This is the thing many have not understood. He is allowing us to rule and reign in our own lives. And he is allowing our words to carry more weight in our life than anyone else's words, including his. Now you, you might think that's too big of a statement, Brother Keith. No. Come on, think about it. If he says that Jesus has paid the price for your sins and, and, and called you to be reconciled with him, and if you say, no, I don't believe it, I'm lost... What are you? You're lost. Your words carry more weight in your life than anyone else's. That's why you shouldn't be so upset about what other people say about you. I know some things are not pleasant, but they don't, their, their words don't carry the authority and weight in your life that yours do. Your words. So, the big danger is that they said something ugly and you believed it and then said it about yourself. Now you got a problem. I create the fruit of the lips. Hallelujah. Is that true? God works with what you say. Is that true? Well, he's not going to be involved in evil. So if you say bad stuff, he's not going to be involved in creating the evil. He's got to leave you alone. And But the enemy jumps up and says, I can work with that. I can work with that. <laughs> if it's involved killing, stealing, and destroying, he's your man. He's ready. Go to Hebrews, please. Hebrews, the third chapter. Now, I know that after the flesh, your flesh doesn't like to hear this. Why? Because your flesh is basically lazy. Everybody's flesh is. But if you don't do something with it, it will get out of hand. It will, it'll do nothing right and everything wrong if you just let it go. And your flesh will go, you mean I got to watch everything I say? <laughs> People don't like that. They'd rather believe God is in control. <laughs> and everything that happens is God. We may not understand it. But what, what, what does that work out 
nothing is my responsibility. <laughs> nothing is my fault. Nothing is my responsibility. I don't have to do anything because it's all up to God anyway. <laughs> Big problem with that? It's a lie. Right. It's not true. Huh? Yeah. And if you don't watch what you say, like we've already said, the enemy will work with it. But notice, is it true that God is involved in the creation of the fruit of our lips and what we say? Notice, Hebrews 3.1. He said, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of what? Our profession, this is exactly the same word in the King James Bible translated confession. Like where we just read in Romans 10, uh, confession is made unto salvation. Same word. So this is confession. G uh, Christ Jesus is the apostle and high priest of what? Of what? Our confession. Now some people will say, well, that, that was just our confession of him of faith. It was. But how can you say just? That you put a limitation on it. That's how we got born again. But the just shall not only be born again by faith, the just shall live by faith. Is that right? What does that mean? The same way you got born again is how you get healed. It's how you get your bills paid. Right? It's how you, how you receive healing for your babies. It's how you, you walk in protection in this dangerous world we live in. What? How does it happen? You believe it in your heart and you say it with your mouth. I will dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. No plague will come near my dwelling. Hallelujah. A thousand may fall at one side and 10,000 at the other, but it won't come near me. Only with my eyes will I behold the reward of the wicked. I'll call on him and he hears me. He's with me. He delivers me. And with long life, he'll satisfy me and show me his salvation. Now, I hear you getting stirred up. Why? Why? Why'd you start going, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? 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 I believe that. So I'm saying it with full conviction. Yes, sir. So there's some punch in my words. Because right. I believe this. Me too. Hallelujah. Yep. And in your heart, you must believe it some too. Because you're going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and some of you started saying it without me saying, say this. You're like, yeah, yeah, me too. See, your spirit wants to do what it was made to do. Your mouth wants to do what it was created to do. God made us this way. We're actually made in his likeness and image. We're supposed to function just like he does, which is believe it, say it, see it. Yeah. Woo hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. What if you feel weak? You feel like you're not able. You look like you're not able. Your friends say, you look bad. <laughs> Let the weak say. Let the weak say. I Well, see, that, that's not how most of the church talks. Why? They don't believe this. They don't believe what we're doing. They believe it's up to God. They don't believe Jesus is the apostle and high priest of what I say. Say it out loud, Jesus, Jesus works, with what I say. works with what I say. Jesus works with my words. I, I, would add, I would add this, if he can. Well, what do you mean if he can? If I'll say what he says. If I'm going to contradict what he said, what can he do with that? 
He has to leave me to myself. And like we said, the other side will say, hey, we can help you with that. You, you want to talk death? You want to talk fear? You want to talk destruction, unbelief? We can help you with that. If we really believed these things, like I said, anything that comes up, what would we do? Number one, shut up. <laughs> Church, are y'all with me? <laughs> huh? Why? If you don't know what to say, don't say anything. Don't ignorantly give your enemy something to, to use against yourself. Number one, don't say anything until you know. Number two, what? Find out what God said about that. And so many things are already in the written word, but then there are other specific things he'll say to you by his spirit. Say this. Well, Phyllis and I do this on a regular basis. I mean, you know, when you got churches and you got friends in the ministry and, and, and you know, you got, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of moving parts. And so there can be something going on all the time. What do you do? You don't want to take the care of it and pine away and say, I just don't know what we're going to do. Man, uh, you know, things are in a mess. I mean, that's talking like an unbeliever that's not even saved. Like there's no hope, like there's no help. You, but you'll do it unless you discipline yourself. You'll feel bad, say the wrong thing. But we immediately begin to do what I'm talking about. The, first off, we'll say nothing. And, and, and numerous times we've told people that have reached out to us, we've said, well, you know, they're, they're wanting us to say something. And we'll say, well, we, we're going to pray about it. We're going to look to the Lord. In other words, we don't have anything to say right now. I could say something, but if it's just me, it's not going to have that, that punch, that power to it, right? Unless it's something we got from him. And so we're looking for what he says about it. And without fail, somebody say he's faithful. He's faithful. Without fail, he will show you, say this. Isn't that right? <laughs> uh, Phyllis, and, and I guess it was, was it Rob and Phyllis and whoever? Yeah, Rob uh, a while back some folks that we knew were in another country and uh, uh, the man and his dad both had become deathly ill. They were right at death's door. Huh? Bingo fever. What's the name of it? Bingo fever. That's not... Uh, yeah, how do you say that? Yeah, yeah, that's... Dang, ding, uh, dangy? Huh? Dangy, whatever, fever. And... and Anyway, they were at death's door. And I guess it was his wife called in desperation. And, and, uh, and of course, we care about them. And uh, it, it looked really bad. But the Spirit of God quickened a word. Say this. Hallelujah. And they did it. And how quick did that happen? Huh? Change that day. Astounding. I mean, just immediately, there, his count was down, that, that main count they had was down to what? Like 20, and what should it be? 200,000. 200, well, they're about dead. And then what, in a day or two's time, it was back up to near normal? There were power in those words. I said, there's power in those words. Why? It wasn't just empty words of something we just tried to quote a random scripture. Come on, can you see this, church? But what do you do? Something comes up. You, 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 you're tempted to feel desperate, to feel scared, to panic. And if you do, and you listen to the wrong thing all day and night, you will say the wrong thing. The wrong thing will come out of your mouth and you say, well, I guess, I guess we're just not going to make it. I just, it's, it's just not going to work. Uh, and, and, and when you do that, the Lord doesn't have anything to work with. Oh, but just like he worked with your words when you said, I believe Jesus is Lord. I believe God has raised him from the dead. Your high priest said, I can work with that. Hallelujah. And you were born again yes. by the glorious power of God. 
And that's not the end of your faith life. That's the beginning of your faith life. And we are to function that way every day of our lives. He's the apostle and the high priest of your confession. Look at the fourth chapter, similar thing. These are not isolated uh, passages. 4.14. 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Is he a great high priest? Oh, yes. Do we need a high priest? Yes. Obviously you do. That's right. <laughs> like Phyllis said, I need help. <laughs> you do too. Oh, yeah. Is that right? Oh, yes. Did you see me? I raised my hand. I said, amen. <laughs> I will take all the good help. The biggest, best help you, you get is from him. The head of the church. He represents us. Ooh, he's our advocate. He represents us in the high court of heaven. And he's the great high priest. But don't skip out on the rest of the phrase. That's not even the end of the sentence. Our great high priest who's passed into the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Seeing we have this great high priest. What's our part? What's our part? Hold fast. That's the same word for confession. Hold fast to your confession. Why? Because he's the apostle and high priest of our confession. He just said that in the previous chapter. Why do I need? Does it, if it didn't matter what I say, this wouldn't be in the Bible. Right? If the Lord just does whatever he decides to do, no matter what I say, you would never find verses like this. Why do I need to hold fast to the right confession, no matter what's going on in my life, what I look like or feel like. Why? Because my high priest yes. needs it yes. to do things for me. Yes. Huh? Yes. Elsewise, he wouldn't be fair in not doing the same thing for everybody on the planet. If the Lord would just moved by needs, miracles would be popping all over the planet. He'd be unfair to do great things for you and not do it for somebody else just because you needed it right. or just because you begged. Religion has taught human beings to be beggars. Just beg, 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 and hope, wish that maybe God will do something. There's no faith in that. And where do we see in the scripture where the Lord said beg? I mean really beg. Beg, and that's how you'll get it. You won't find that. That's men's traditions. What did he tell us to do? Come on, church. What did he tell us to do? Believe in your heart. Huh? And say it with your mouth in full conviction. And no matter what you see and what you feel, hold fast. Oh, somebody say hold fast. Hold fast. To your confession. What do you mean? Hold fast. No matter how many bills come in, you say, I call every need met. I call every bill paid. My God supplies all my needs. That's right. People say, do you, do you think we'll have enough? You go, no. We'll have more than enough. We'll have more than enough. Does it matter what we say? If the Lord Here's us saying, I believe the Word of God. The Lord's my source. He meets all my needs. I call every bill paid. Can he work with that? Come on, can he? He said it. He said it. So he's working with his own words. But they're coming out of my mouth, which means he can do it for me. Said out loud, I have a great high priest, the Son of God, Jesus Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I will, so I will. Hold, fast hold fast to my confession. To my confession. Go to Malachi in closing, I think. Well, actually, you, you need two verses instead of one. <laughs> right, two Go to 1 Timothy 6. I could quote it to you, but go to 1 Timothy 6. Um, 
Like we said before, you might think, well, Brother Keith, I, you know, I, I listened to teachings on confession back in the 80s. Uh, <laughs> well, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Did you ever start doing it? That's a good word. Right? Did you ever implement it into your life? And people who live around you know whether you did or not by the way you talk. Why did I say all that? Well, 1 Timothy 6, 12 says what? Fight the good fight of faith. How do you do that? Lay hold, yes, but keep reading. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto you are also called, and have what? That's the word for confess, same word. You have confessed a good confession before many witnesses. What does that have to do with fighting the good fight of faith? This is the number one way you release your faith. And what is the sword of the Spirit? It's the Word of God, right? And how do you wield the sword of the Spirit? With your mouth, His words, in your mouth, from a fully persuaded heart are powerful and the Holy Spirit can back them. The holy angels can work with them. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold. You profess the good profession. Look at the very next verse, verse 13. I give you charge in the sight of God who quickens all things before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate did what? He holds up to us the, the chief example of Jesus, this is in connection with fighting the good fight of faith. He already said it twice in the previous verse about your confession, your confession. Then he brings up how that when Jesus stood before Pilate, this was a, I mean, this was a situation. And what did Jesus do? He didn't beg. He didn't say something in unbelief. He confessed a good confession. Hallelujah. He only said what the Father gave him to say. He is the preeminent example. You never heard Jesus. The 12 and the 70 and anybody around him never heard him poor mouth. Never heard him talk about how scared he was. Never. Never. They never heard him talk about, I don't know what we're going to do. Never. Is he your example or not? Do you have a different, better example? No, sir. Then he's your example. Yes, sir. Do you want to talk like him? Yes. Morning, noon, and night. Yes. Do you want it to be said, people around about you? Well, I tell you one thing, you won't hear them talk unbelief. Right. You won't hear them talk fear. That's right. You won't hear them talk failure and destruction. Right. Why? You don't want to give the enemy anything that he can work with to hurt you or yours in your life, and you want to give God everything. Is that right? Yes that he can bring to pass in your life. Yes. Now go to Malachi, the third chapter. <laughs> Malachi 3 and 13. The Lord here said, your words have been stout against me. Let's just stop right here. If it didn't matter what we said, this could not be. We're talking about the Almighty. Huh? Many people think if God does exist in their mind, He created all this, He gave it a spin. There's seven billion of us down here or something. He could really care less about most of what's going on and hardly takes notice of it. I mean, among seven billion people plus, God's going to even notice something you said today? I mean, there's a lot of talk going on down here. Right? Does God pay attention to everything that everybody says? I didn't say that. But His people... 
I said, his people that believe in him? Why would he say this? Your words have been stout against me. Why would he care what you said? He obviously does. Say it out loud. What I say matters. My words matter. They matter to God. Do they? They matter to God and they matter to me. They matter to your family. Especially if you've got somebody in your family that's not doing right, not doing well, not even trying to live right or claiming to be an agnostic or atheist or whatever the case might be. Somebody needs to say something good over them because they're not doing it. Is that right? And even most church going people would just talk about it and go, you know, well, I guess they're going to hell. I, I don't know, man. Look what a mess they're in. And all they're going to do is talk what they see and, and the bad stuff. Somebody yes. somewhere yes. needs to say something God can work with. Yes. Something that can make a difference in their life. Now, it'll carry no weight if you don't believe it. But if you believe it and you, and you pray and you commune with God and you feed on the Word... And he'll give you a word to speak over your kids, your children, your grandchildren. He'll, he'll quote something to you from the written word of God. And when you get it, you say it. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. You may just be praying one morning and the Lord will say, I'm showing them some things. Then you got your word. Yes. I said, you got your word. Yes. Somebody says, man, did you hear what crazy thing they did last night? And you just say, the Lord's showing them some things. What's going on? The Lord's showing them some things. That's your word. Yeah. Come on, can you see what I'm talking about? That's your word. Yeah. And you don't have to have a different word like that. I mean, the Bible talks about he sends laborers, uh, you know, cross their path. And, right. and he enlightens the eyes of their heart and understanding. There's numerous things the Lord had quickened to you. But no matter what you see and feel, uh, if you are that kind of person, then you are a rock in the family. You are an anchor. Hallelujah. With a connection from them to God, even though they say they don't want it, they have no idea how desperately they need it. And out of, I was praying about a relative some years ago. And they, it's astounding that they hadn't been killed 40 times. The crazy, illegal, improper stuff they've done. And I was praying about a thing with them. And you almost, you think, well, you know, you know they don't deserve anything from the Lord. Uh, but, but I said, Lord, would you, would you have mercy on them about this? And the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, I'll do that just because you asked me to. Oh, somebody say, thank the Lord. He is so merciful. He's so gracious. Will he do that? He'll do things that people, I mean, maybe they should have been judged 20 years ago. And just because you asked him to, he is merciful. But then you need to speak in line with what you prayed and what you heard him say the next day and the next day and the next day. What's happening with them? I got a word. The Lord's having mercy on them. He's sparing them. He's giving them more opportunities. That's what's happening. I don't care what I see, what I hear, what I feel. That's what's happening. And the Lord can work with that. Hallelujah. He said, your words have been stout or strong against me. The Lord said that. And they say, what have we spoken so much against you? And that's where a lot of folks would be today. If they, realized, if they heard directly from the Lord and he said that, they'd go, What? What did we say? And, and he quoted some things. That he quoted a couple of things that they said. He said, you have said. Now let's just stop right there. God listened to what they said. And he cared about what they said. And it bothered him what they said. And he's quoting back to them what they said. He said out loud, my words matter. God listens, to my words. God listens to my words. 
They matter to him. He said, you said it is vain to serve God. And he, he's saying, that word was strong against me. You could say it like this, quoting from Psalm 78 and other places. It limited me. It restricted me. It hindered me. Because you said it does no good to serve God. And what profit is it that we've kept his ordinance? Now, reckon any church people have said things like that? What good does it do to pray? The, the Lord cares about something like that. He's like, what are you saying? Phyllis and I have just been astonished at some situations where people... It's obvious God has answered prayer. He's done miracles in their life. And, and they've had this issue for a while. And one of them the other day said, you know, what, what did they say about that? God never, God's never done anything for me. We about fell off our chair. We thought, are you crazy? God's never done anything for me. Isn't that what they said? God's never done anything for me. Never done anything for me. Let's start with one point. You exist. You're breathing. What a lie. Right? How do you get to the, a place like that? Who told them that? You see, somebody's been pushing that on them for months and longer. And what did he want? What did, what did the enemy want to happen? He wanted them to open up their mouth and say that. Come on, can you see that? Because that opens a door for him. It's, it, it closes and, and hinders between them and God. It blocks. It's stout against their God. If you're going to say, you've never done anything for me. Somebody say, I refuse to say that. I will never say anything like that. That is a lie. But can you see what we're talking about? Why would God care? If it didn't matter. Yeah. Unless it's true. Yeah. He actually creates. The fruit of your lips. Wow. He creates. His words that come out of your mouth. And Jesus the apostle and high priest. Of your confession. Is working. With his words. In your mouth. Yes. Oh hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's say the opposite. Of what they said. <laughs> huh. They said it does no good to serve God. What are you going to say? It pays. It pays to serve God. They said it, 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 there's no profit in keeping his ordinance. In other words, I mean, tithing does no good. Praying does no good. All that confession stuff, there's nothing to that. There's people who said that. Not me. Not me. It's working for me, brother. I said, whoo, it's working for us. I said, it's working for us. It's working for us big time. I'm tithing is working for me. It's, wor whoo, it's working for Phyllis. Offerings, confession, faith, protection, love. It's working for me. Being led by the Spirit is paying off. Big time for me. Hey! Stand on your feet, everybody. Stand on your feet. And say, it's working for me. Man, it's working. It is working for me. We're going to make it work for us tonight, too. Anyone remember the steps he talked about in this message? Number one, shut up. Shut up. If you don't know what to say, just shut up. Then what's number two? What, find out what he says. And then number three, say it. Say it. If you didn't write those down, write those down. Shut up, find out what he says, and say it. Tell you what your life would look like if you did that right there. Man, we're going to, we, this was the last one. We've had some confessions. We're going to confess God's word. Uh, we've got some slides with some confessions. We're going to go over them together uh, as we dismiss tonight. Are you all ready? 
Here's what will help. We're going to go through five of these. You're going to think, man, that's long. You know what will help? It will help if you believe that what you're saying is what you're going to have. You'll be excited to say it then. You'll want more of these. All right? So let's mix our faith with it as we say it. Are you all ready? Let's do it. Our children and grandchildren. I don't have grandchildren. You Not yet you don't. You may as well get a head start on it. All right? Our children and grandchildren are taught of the Lord, obedient to his will, and great is their peace and undisturbed composure. They are established in righteousness. Oppression is far from them, for they shall not fear. We are increased more and more, spirit, soul, body, relationally, financially, and influentially, us and our children. We are filled with the love of God, the wisdom of God, and the fire of God. Our souls are at rest and flourishing in peace and understanding. Our relationships are strong, loving, kind, forgiving, and flourishing. Wealth and riches are in our house, and our righteousness endures forever. We are ever able and ever ready to be a blessing to those around us and to give abundantly to every good work. We are kingdom carriers in our generation. Let's do some more. We call our bodies healed, whole, and strong. They serve us well and in health and strength all the days of our lives. No plague, no pestilence, no evil, no destruction comes near our dwelling. With long life, God satisfies us and shows us his salvation. All grace abounds to us, and we have all sufficiency in all things, and we abound to every good work. We are living memorials in the earth to show that the Lord is upright and faithful to his promises. Amen. We lay hands on the sick, and they recover. We lay hands on the sick, and they recover. This shouldn't be lost on us. Jesus told us to do this. We're to lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Weapons may be formed, but no weapon formed against us prospers. It is impossible for a weapon to succeed against the blood of Jesus that covers us, the blood that saves, keeps, heals, preserves, protects, delivers, and brings life to us, now in the presence of our enemies and throughout all eternity. There is no lack in our household because the Lord is our shepherd. Amen. There is no depression or hopelessness in our household because we know and are convinced we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I call our house and this house blessed in Jesus' name. Our eyes are bright, our hearts are filled with truth, our lips speak words of life and truth. We will be a blessing to many, and 2024 will be the best year of our lives. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Do you believe it? Guess what? That's what we're going to walk in then. That's what we're going to walk in. We'll probably find a way to share those with you if you want those, and that way you can have those and be confessing those and stay on it. Sound good? All right, we love you guys. Hey, remember, invite somebody this weekend, speak words of life, and let's be expecting. All right? All right, you are dismissed.